Hello and welcome to this short film, one of the series of little historical films I've got on my YouTube um, channel. My name's Eric Grigg. Um, this one's about Lincolnshire, um, Lincolnshire's links to New Zealand, and hopefully at the end I'm going to show you my favourite Kiwi artefact. Now, why am I interested in New Zealand? Well, in 1996 I visited New Zealand, spent a job all month there roaming around the places, traveling on some of the fantastic rail lines and visiting some of the wonderful museums in the uh, in that country. Um, in April 2016, I was uh, lucky enough to be given permission to put on a display of some of the things that normally in the stores and bring them out. Um, some fantastic sort of things related to New Zealand and some Maori um, artifacts. And that's the uh, that's in the stores. That's me very poorly and badly painting some uh, some display material for it. Um, in 2018, I wrote uh, an article called Lincolnshire's Links to New Zealand, um, highlighting some of the uh, the links between the county of Lincolnshire in the UK, where I live, and New Zealand. Um, and there are some very interesting links, and I'm going to go through them in a minute. Um, and in 2020. Um, I taught a uh, military history course and one of the lectures featured um, the New Zealand Wars of 1845 to 72 at Bishop Grotes University here in Lincoln. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that later on. So um, connections with uh, New Zealand and when people got to New Zealand, it's a last big sort of land mass. Um, Apart from Antarctica, which is pretty inhospitable, it's the last sort of very habitable landmass that got colonised by humans. We think there might be, it may have been earlier, but the latest thinking by people who know a lot more about this than me is about 1320 to 1340 series of uh, waves of um, Polynesian people um, colonise New Zealand, um, and they are the Maori people of New Zealand. Uh, still around today, um, the country that they called Aotearoa, land of the long white cloud. Um, 1642, um, Dutch explorer Abel Tasman um, saw New Zealand, but he didn't land. Uh, 1769, Cook's first expedition um, land, and with it had Joseph Banks. Now, he's one of the Lincolnshire connections because he, although he was born in Lincolnshire, spent his whole life living in Lincolnshire, the botanist Joseph Banks, and his journals are an interesting um, viewpoint from the sort of Western point of view, European point of view about New Zealand, though the Maoris have obviously got their own um, stories and history and culture. Um, he describes seeing their, what he thinks of as a, as a war dance, um, which is possibly the first written um, description of what we think of as a haka. Um, people often think of the haka generally as a war dance, but you listen to Maori's talk and they, they talk about the haka being more of a way of telling stories. Um, and he talks about the um, the necklaces and the green stone and the strange green stone man that they have hanging around the neck. Now, that little picture there is a couple of the green stone necklaces that my uh, sister brought me um, in New Zealand and brought back and gave to me. Um, and there's a little uh, green stone man, um, usually called a high tiki, that's uh, very popular and with people that visit New Zealand and it's a traditional sort of Maori figure and uh, I, I have one round my neck at the moment so it's it's interesting seeing this uh, reading this account of like that's the first European that's seen one of these high tickies and I think oh, that's interesting I've got one myself and then Thomas Kendall is another one of these interesting links between Lincolnshire and New Zealand Thomas Kendall was born in Lincolnshire um, and he went out to New Zealand um, during the musket wars, and the musket wars were a um, terribly sort of destructive series of wars where um, firearms had been introduced to New Zealand and it completely upset the balance of power between certain other Maori tribes. Um, and because tribes moved from one place to another, there was a lot of confusion over who owned which bit of land, which led to a lot of very sort of dodgy land deals. And it's they're still sort of trying to sort out the repercussions of the musket wars today. 
Thomas Kendall arrived during that partly early sort of European settlement of New Zealand. Um, he was uh, there as a missionary and Thomas Kendall is a very interesting but really controversial person in, uh, in sort of New Zealand history. He goes back to England with a uh, very minor Maori chief called Hongi Hika um, and he publishes a book called the New Zealanders first book um, and that is the first time the, the Maori language is, is written down and there's all sort of debates today about whether um, Kendall got the pronunciation right and that whether he's oversimplified the language and all debates on, on that, whether he's skewed our sort of view of the language but it's very interesting getting this really early um, writing of the uh, of the language um, and then he 1820 published the grammar and vocabulary of the language in New Zealand and it's got one of those um, it's got those little sort of dummy conversations that you have I mean I remember growing up and learning French and we'd all have to have dummy conversations like where is the where is the station and it's the station is over there and all this sort of thing and then these sorts of little dummy conversations it's all like you know can I buy some muskets would you like to you know sell some pigs and you can see the sort of lifestyle and the thought processes um, of the people who are living in, in in New Zealand at the time the, the settlers and the way the, the kind of conversations they would have with the Maori um, and the Maori would have with the settlers um, from a sort of very European point of view through these conversations so um, so he um, goes back with 500 muskets in 1821 um, remember he's a missionary now I'm not sure which bit of the New Testament says that you know if you want money for your um, spreading the word of Jesus good arms deal is the is the thing to do um, and pumping 500 muskets with in a uh, in a war zone is uh, only going to lead to more chaos and death but uh, there we go as I say Thomas Kendall um, fascinating bloke um, very controversial bloke now Kendall um, eventually he's meant to be a missionary um, runs off with a Maori girl uh, temporarily sort of says oh Christianity is rubbish and adopts the Maori religion um, comes back calls back to his wife is somehow is forgiven but not really by the uh, church missionary society um, he's sacked and he's um, he ends up um, dying um, in, a, in a boat just off the coast of uh, Australia where he was living at the time so Thomas Kendall fascinating fascinating bloke bit of a controversial bloke and yeah putting selling or giving guns away during the middle of a civil war um, not not a good thing to do in my book. Um, the New Zealand Wars, this is, as I said, something that I, uh, I when I talk 19th century battles, I thought, let's put one of these in because, you know, it's, a, it's very interesting teaching in Britain what um, uh, British imperial forces were doing around the world to open students' eyes to some of the things that went on. Um, the New Zealand Wars, it used to be called the Maori Wars and then the Maori went, hang on a minute, you fought us, you attacked us, why is it named after us? So it's now um, usually called the New Zealand Wars, though so someone has suggested that the uh, the name um, Tiriri Pakeha, the white man's anger, might be a better, better name for this war. Um, 2000 Maori died in it, coupled with the musket wars, and the diseases the Europeans um, brought over it decimated the um, Maori population um, when Europeans first landed there were probably about 150,000 Maori yeah, we're not exactly sure but by 1896 there was only 43,000 so you can see the effects that the musket wars and the disease and the New Zealand wars had on the population and by 1860 European settlers for the first time outnumbered the Maori they've written they lost um, Maori lost a, a million hectares of land some of it has been returned but it meant a massive shift in land ownership from the, the native people to the settlers so not a good thing in terms of the uh, the natives and it's uh, 
you know the stories of the of the battles are um, are, are fascinating and the, the Maori fought using these uh, fortified hilltop things which were um, had almost like a trench like appearance out of them and so it's very interesting referencing the difficulty European troops had in in taking these trenched um, fortified pars or hill forts um, and parallels to what happened obviously in 1914 to 1918 with the trenches there from a military history point of view. So fascinated with the um, culture of the place, I um, bought myself a nice Māori artefact, which I'm quite fond of, and I want to share with you. This is this is it. It's a Waihaka. Um, now I'm quite clearly not of Māori heritage. I'm not even a Kiwi when I I count to ten, not tin, as most Kiwis would do. Only joking. Um, so if you want to know what this object means or what sort of the what the uh, New Zealand wars mean to a Maori or what the culture language or anything else means or symbolizes don't ask me look elsewhere the Tapapa Museum in Wellington which is a fantastic museum great place to visit um, has, a, has, a, has a great website and they uh, when I put on the display they were very helpful and because we had some things rather poorly labeled in the uh, in the store so we had things labeled Australasian and I was sending them pictures going so is this Maori or is this Aboriginal and um, we had things that were labeled Polynesian and we found out weren't just Polynesian they were specifically Maori we had things that were labeled um, as being from New Zealand and we found out that they weren't um, so their experts are really good and their experts are really good in, in telling us how we should label these things properly and handle them respectfully and I've worked with um, scholars um, uh, working in um, Britain on how we should treat these things these objects with respect um, as a someone called uh, Laura Jackson who was at the University of Lincoln who's um, now somewhere else and she's uh, she's married to a Maori and she me and her worked out these um, hack guidelines mainly her on how to treat the Maori objects with the appropriate respect because these are there's a lot of the Maori objects we have in the stores were are um, they're, they're considered tayoga which means sort of treasured possessions and you should treat them with respect and use the appropriate tikanga which is the rituals in, in looking after them basically you know don't handle them around food or drink or smoke or step over them and you know don't put them in a cabinet of curiosities they're things that tell a story in and of themselves things like that this um waihaka is a is a patu which means um, sort of means club that they were never used in, in, in a, as a club. Um, the name means fish mouth and the shape is meant to look like a fish's mouth, especially if it's the other way up to how it's pictured there. Now, <clears throat> after the musket wars, during the musket war, before the musket wars, there's lots of uh, Maori weaponry which is used for hand-to-hand -hand fighting and you have to be up close to someone. And when you watch sort of videos or listen to Maori talk about how these things were used in warfare, you know, you have to be close to your enemy. You have to watch their footwork and their body language, thinking where they're going to move next. Give people muskets um, and you've got a handheld weapon. They can be miles away. Um, very little training. Um, no how to load the thing, point it, aim it, shoot at you and you're dead before you get anywhere near them. So as weapons of war from the musket wars onwards they became utterly redundant so things like this um, beautifully carved objects like this would often be used by the rangatira the chief when making a point or giving a speech and used in ceremonies so they became more ceremonial you also got lots of them being um because they're beautifully carved they're lovely objects been used as sort of gift giving um so if someone visited um someone that says you know here you go here's a gift to um, take away to, to remember us um, and a lot of them are also used as a way of um, raising money of, of, as, a, as a sort of an industry thing you carve these things and you you sell them to visitors and tourists as a way of keeping these um, sort of cultures and traditions and skills of carving alive and generating an income so 
some of them are made out of whalebone um paroa of which uh, but this one's wood i've seen them some of them carved from the cowrie tree this one isn't this one is meant to be by someone who knows a lot more than me and i and this is probably going to be the worst pronunciation of all the poor pronunciations i've done is a puhutu kawa which is the new zealand christmas tree and it's got a lovely dense grain and it's a lovely dark wood that me growing up in the northern hemisphere we've got very sort of um light much lighter wood traditionally and much thicker grain so this thing looks sort of beautiful sort of like lovely sort of tropical um, type of wood and it's got a great sort of patina and, and colour and shape to it. British museums are full of things that have been in the past literally plundered from cultures around the world um, and sometimes they're they're taken and it's not recorded where they were taken from so even if the museum wanted to give it back there's no record of which place it came from which village it came from which peoples it came from where it should be taken back to this isn't this is almost certainly a, a 20th century souvenir or presentation gift so this is not so an object and i wouldn't want to have an object where someone's gone in um, and invaded a country and stolen a cultural artifact this is a uh, this is a, the 20th century souvenir let's have a look at it in a bit more detail um, the shiny things are eyes for the carved figures and then made from power shells which is the abalone which um, the inside of the shell um, has this lovely shiny sort of um, um, mother of pearly bits inside which you can reuse in sort of decoration shines up beautifully there's a couple of very abstract figures carved on it um, one above the handle one on the butt some of these are sort of half human like figures tiki but these seems to be they're so abstract um, it's very difficult to work out what they are um, meant to be this creature again of part you know apologies for anyone Maori for mispronouncing this manaya which is a bird like creature sometimes with a fish tail and that's what we seem to have on the on the butt and just above the handle it's pointed blade down which is is a, is a passive way of displaying it there there's a cord threaded through a square chisel hole this is typical of this sort of object um, and the cord goes around your wrist it means if it gets knocked out your hand in battle you haven't lost your weapon you still can pick it up not that this was probably ever used in battle um, the hook um, is meant to design to sort of be able to catch the enemy's weapon but this one is very smooth suggesting confirming the idea that this is a ceremonial thing a later thing rather than a, a one that was ever used in battle the end down the bottom there is a sort of narrow blade um, people often think of these things as clubs but they're not for bashing someone over the head therefore uh, thrusting and using the, the the blade which is at the very bottom of that picture into your enemy rather than using it as a as a clumpy weapon knocking someone over the head um what examples of these i've seen that are early that look like weapons seem to and i may be wrong um seem to have short handles this one's quite a long handle um suggesting it's or confirming that it's never been used as a weapon which is nice <laughs> <laughs> 